Well, welcome to the third session of this Congress about the human person and the family as the basis of society and human rights. Uh, I have, um, I have uh, Professor Valas Shanda, I hope I, I say it well, <laughs> uh, from the Catholic University of Budapest. He is uh, graduating in legal and political science uh, from the, oh, thank you. Um, he holds a, li a licentiate in canon law and a PhD and an habilitation in legal sciences. He is head of the Department of Constitutional Law at the Faculty of Law and Political Science of the Pasmasi Peter Cath Catholic University in Budapest. He, he lectures and publishes mainly in constitutional law, ecclesiastical law, religious freedom and issues, and church-state relations. He is uh, going to speak about human person and pre-political foundation of human rights. And Breda, uh, Mrs. Breda O'Brien, 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 okay, O'Brien, <laughs> columnist of the Irish Times, Ireland. She is going to speak about marriage and family, school of belonging and participation in the common good. She is a frequent contributor to the media, debates on social, religious, ethical, and education issues. She's married and has four children, so I think he knows uh, how the marriage and the family can work for the common good. Um, in the past, she has worked as a columnist also in the Sunday Business Post as a researcher in RTA and a V2 producer. He has a degree in theology in English from the Matter Day Institute in Dublin and Master in Communication from Dublin City University. Breda is also a patron of Yona Institute with a pro-family, pro-religion think tank. So uh, we are going to begin with uh, Professor Vala Shanda, if you can take place. Um, I had one, uh, we are missing one headphone. If someone has forgot to give it yesterday, please to, uh, tell to the secretariat. Thank you. Yeah. It should be on. Move closer. It's Yesterday, someone asked me if I'm going to speak in Hungarian. No, this is Hanglish. It's not Hungarian I'm speaking. <laughs> and I would like to dedicate my paper to a very dear Italian friend of mine who has been lying in coma now for several months. In his conscious life, he has been a powerful witness of Christ for me and many others. In his present fate, he gives a testimony about human dignity. We agree about the rights, but on condition, no one asks us why, as Jacques Maritain has put it, at the adoption of the Universal Declaration. Do human rights need a foundation, or can they exist without a foundation? As Janne Hall and Matt Lari puts it, the central political question today when we debate human rights is not the concept of right, but the concept of human. To follow this line, we can refer to Charles Malik. When we disagree about what human rights mean, we disagree about human nature. The human person seems to be central. More so, the human person seems to be the central issue when human rights are discussed. We witness in our days that on the one hand, unexpected aspects of the life of the human person become uncertain. On the other hand, the human rights language becomes stronger. We face a situation when the notion of human rights is more and more detached from its fundamentals, And human rights become more and more controversial. Human rights detached from their fundament become like a loose cannon on the boat. A, a cannon can be very useful on a ship uh, when it is, it, is, it is under attack. A loose cannon is devastating. 
Human rights are pre-political in the sense that they are not given or granted by any politicians to their citizen, but they are discovered through human reasoning as being constitutive to the human being itself. The human person, a woman or a man, irrespective of all dividing aspects, has a dignity. Rights, rights derive from the respect of this dignity. The question of the day is if this dignity is inherent or it is self-made. Is the claim to have one's dignity respected objective or subjective? To give an example, euthanasia, the debate of, on euthanasia, shows that there is a deep misunderstanding on dignity, as some use this term for feeling well. If dignity is considered to be inherent, then it has to be inherent for all human beings, including those who feel miserable at a certain point of their life. But an inherent and objective dignity claims respect and urges us, fellow citizen, and also the state, to respect this dignity. Human dignity seems to be central to the first comprehensive international human rights document, and this is the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, adopted 1948, half a year before the Universal Declaration, by the Conference of American States. According to this document, the preamble, the American states have, uh, have acknowledged the dignity of the individual. The American states have on repeated occasions recognized that the essential rights of man are not derived from the fact that he is a national of a certain state, but are based upon the attributes of his human personality. In the preamble, we read a sentence well known to all of us from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted the same year. All men are born free and equal in dignity and rights, being endowed with, by nature with reason and conscience, they should conduct themselves as brothers one to another. Later in this, doc is, in this document, dignity is linked to the right to property. Every person has the right to own such private property as meets his essential needs of decent living and helps to maintain the dignity of the individual and of the home. The individual and the home need a dignity. Two decades later, the American Convention on Human Rights, enforced since 1978, links dignity to the right to human treatment. The person seems to be central to the European Convention on Human Rights, but the convention did not expressly mention dignity until Protocol 13 on the abolition of death penalty in all circumstances, 2002. According to this document, the member states of the Council of Europe convinced that everyone's right to life is a basic value in a democratic society and that the abolition of the death penalty is essential for the protection of this right and the full recognition of the inherent dignity of all human beings. Taking a closer look to our neighbor's human dignity, the concept also seems to be a cornerstone of the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. Adopted by the Islamic Conference in 1990, I think in, a, in the dialogue uh, with Islam, this document is worth, uh, worth studying. The preamble refers to a right to a dignified life. In contribution to the efforts of mankind, the asset uh, to, as to assert human rights, to protect man from exploitation and persecution, and to affirm his freedom and right to a dignified life in accordance with the Islamic Sharia, as the preamble says. Article 1 refers again to, to human dignity. All human beings 
form one family whose members are united by their subordination to Allah and descend from Adam. All men are equal in terms of basic human dignity and basic obligations and responsibilities without any discrimination on the basis of race, color, language, belief, sex, religion, political affiliation, social status, or other considerations. The true religion, according to this document, the true religion is the guarantee for enhancing such dignity along the path to human integrity. For armed conflicts, there are special provisions in this, uh, in, in this document. Uh, and it's not a, it's an interstate document, still signed by 40 Islamic states, members, member countries to the uh, Islamic conference. Uh, according to, to Article 4, every human being is entitled to human sanity and the protection of one's good name and honor during one's lifetime and after one's death. The state and the society shall protect one's body and burial pay, place from desecration. The other aspect, human dignity appears in the Islamic document, is with regard to marriage and family. Family is the foundation of society, and marriage is the basis of making a family. Man and woman have the right to marriage, and no restrictions stemming from race, color, or nationality, religion is not mentioned here anymore, no restrictions stemming from race, color, or nationality shall prevent them from exercising this right. The society and the state shall remove all obstacles to marriage and facilitate it, and shall protect the family and safeguard its welfare. Woman is equal to man in human dignity, etc. The husband is responsible for the maintenance and the welfare of the family. Well, the language of the American documents and the Islamic one may be different. It is different. But when we read them, probably it is not uh, far-fetched to say that we feel they have something in common. There has to be a common human nature. And we witness in our days that this human nature becomes under fierce attack in its mere existence due to the escalation of violence in armed conflicts, but also in other battlefields, like courts and legislations in various European states. By accident, it may be by accident, dignity appears in the American Declaration in connection to property, whereas in the Islamic one, it is discussed in connection to marriage. Property, in some ways, belongs to human nature, even small kids have a natural concept of it. If we consider the simple logic of children, my teddy is not yours. Uh, mine is, a, is a, one of the very first words uh, kids, uh, kids say. Without this notion, this natural notion on property, there is no education towards a generosity possible. Certainly, these belongings, grandmother's earrings, the family home are real and natural. In many languages, real property is, uh, is immovable property. That is, that is real. Uh, a piece of land, uh, a building is real. Um, nonetheless, much of the property in our days becomes virtual. Let us just consider the common practice of renting and leasing instead of owning. This notion changes attitudes. It changes human behavior. When the surrounding world becomes virtual, we have, to, we have to be extremely careful so that our life as such should remain real. We got a fat and heavy book uh, upon arrival as a nice gift that is real. Uh, we can touch it. It is a book. Uh, we can have a whole library on a pen drive. But somehow, we don't feel that re to be real in the same way. And uh, the fight to encounter reality is, I think, crucial for the Christian experience, as Christ is real. In a virtual world, when we have no real friends, we have no real experience, we don't confront the, na the nature as such, um, 
I think it's a, it's a temptation that we that we only uh, make up uh, an idol for ourselves. How the concept of marriage becomes under attack is more widely discussed in our days. A few words about the challenges with regard to human person and its rights. First of all, there is a there is a, a deep crisis with regard to clarity. We are on a road to uncertainty. We experience the challenge of a relativist and subjectivist mentality that connects us to the question if the inherent nature of rights are still, is still accepted. The lack of clarity regarding the fundamentals opens a way to uncertainty. The preamble of the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights states, quote, conscious of its spiritual and moral heritage, the Union is founded on the indivisible, universal values of human dignity, freedom, equality, and solidarity, based on principles, etc. Article 1 states, human dignity is inviolable. It must be respected and protected. This seems to acknowledge the inherent nature of human dignity. But to give a closer example for my country, constitutional changes and legislative changes even may be unconscious. The new Hungarian basic law adopted by a conservative majority in 2011 omitted the reference to the inherent nature of the right to life. Our constitution had this formula from 1989 to 2011. According to that, quote, in the Republic of Hungary, every human being has the inherent right to life and to human dignity, of which no one can be arbitrarily deprived, unquote. There is a general statement referring in the basic law to the inviolable and inalienable nature of, of fundamental rights that appears in the first sentence on human rights. But due to a strange misunderstanding, the Constitution speaks about the right to human dignity instead of the right to have one's dignity respected. It may be just a, for some, maybe it's just a play of words. No, it is a fundamental question with regard to clarity. And goodwill does not substitute clarity. Living in a world without evident borderlines will be extremely tiring. For centuries, not just religion, denomination, has been evident for most people, and not just professions were inherited in the family. I don't speak about the Latin clergy, but, but, uh, but by, with the Byzantine clergy, it's a, it's, it's a well-known phenomenon in our countries that most priests uh, come from families of, of priests. But also, garments uh, functioned almost as uniforms. A dear teacher of mine told us that, uh, in fact, all garments uh, are uniforms. Jeans are the uniform of people pretending not to wear a uniform. But in our days, my gender, my name, I even can change my name, my spouse, my family, will be uncertain. It will be, in these, under these, these conditions, it will be more and more difficult to redefine myself every day. Do I still have my wife? Uh, did, did something happen overnight? At the end, one will have to decide to use the men's room or the ladies' room, depending on the clothes one is wearing, like the person uh, who has won the Eurovision Song Contest this year. This type of liberty may end up in an neurosis. Too many decisions every day. One of the most essential contribu contributions we can offer to, def to the defense of human rights is clarity with regard to their fundamentals. And maybe from this morning's homily, this prophetical vocation of the church is relating also to this, uh, to this mission, service with regard to clarity. Without these fundamental rights, um, human rights are, without these fundamentals, human rights are more and more uncertain. Let us just uh, identify a few sensitive issues. Life and death is one of them, certainly. Dignity is recognized as unviolable on the one hand, 
On the other hand, new rights are derived from dignity. Self-determination seems to be at the top of the agenda in many ways. But self-determination originally was the right of peoples to constitute an independent state, an independent state, colonies. Nowadays, it is more and more often used as an individual right, like patient self-determination, self-determination with regard to health care. The personal liberty as an essential result of dignity, however, cannot be, the, cannot be, uh, uh, the personal liberty cannot be unlimited. A dignity-seeking recognition presupposes an identity. When identities are substituted by the mood or the ideas of the day, they cannot be accommodated as identities can. Identity can be accommodated. My ideas of the day cannot be accommodated. Besides the right to life, all other human rights, con all other human rights concerns seem to be disproportionate. And the floating borderlines of life and death are shivering. The scandal of abortion and euthanasia has been widely discussed, and we cannot underestimate the significance of this discussion or even this fight. But we should not forget a number of other related issues with regard to life and death. In the hospital of, of, my, of Debrecen, a, a major city in my country, in 2013, last year, a young lady who has been brain dead due to an apocalyptic stroke since the 15th week of her pregnancy, was able to carry out her baby as she was kept alive until the 27th week of, of the pregnancy. And her baby was made to be born in a way or another 92 days after the mother died. In other cases, brain dead, in other cases brain dead patients are used as organ donors without any concern. The borderline between death and life, life and death, uh, needs probably a closer, um, a closer scrutiny. Equality, another hot topic. Dignity is equal to all. All who are so different in many other ways. Equal treatment receives more and more emphasis and becomes a hot issue. We rightly spend on the accessibility of buildings. On the other hand, over 90% of babies diagnosed with a, post, uh, with a potential Down syndrome are aborted, are aborted across Europe and the US. Without a proper fundament, non-discrimination becomes its own caricature. Marriage, a third hot topic. Marriage and family are essential in defining the person. When marriage and family are redefined, the essence of human rights is challenged. Certainly the tragedy of forced marriages had and has to be overcome. The free choice of marital status, the equal dignity of man and woman needed acknowledgement as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did. Men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, religion have the right to marry and to found a family. They are entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage and its dissolution. Marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. Family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and uh, is entitled to protection by society and the state. This document, the Universal Declaration 48, linked family to marriage. Yet international, document, international human rights instruments step by step loosened this linkage. Earlier this year, close attention was paid to a case of a transgender applicant at the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, when the court, with some dissents, restated its case law, according to which Article 8 of the Convention cannot be interpreted as imposing an obligation on contracting state to grant same-sex same -sex couples access to marriage. Thus, it cannot be said that there exists any European consensus on allowing same-sex same -sex marriages. 
the seemingly small steps carried out at the legislative level in various European states undermine fundamental notions at the European level as well. The constitution maker, once upon a time, had its evident concept on marriage. And now the legislator, with a simple majority, feels itself entitled to change the meaning of this notion. Supranational bodies first observe the floating meanings of words. And then in the lack of judicial self-restraint, they may engage into the redefinition of words themselves. Are rights of married couples and families infringed when other couples or, and unions get equal rights? Yes, it may happen so. If we cannot call realities by their name, our very essence may be questions, questioned. More so, it is an aggression against human nature, infringing the rights of individuals and families. Freedom seems to grow. In fact, it is disappearing. New rights have an unforeseeable price. The first victims are competing rights, like the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion. Self-appointed champions of human rights show no to tolerance to the diversity of ideas and viewpoints. Defendants, defenders of a conjugal marriage are labeled as homophobes, and this strangely defined homophobia becomes treated as racism. And here we have to stop for a moment uh, to, to, look a, 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 to, a close, to have a closer look at the European Court of Human Rights uh, jurisprudence. This court plays a growing role in shaping the national legislations and the human rights discourse all over Europe. Practical difficulties of the court, like the extreme backlog, are not without uh, consequences. The practice of the court seems to be uncertain in very sensitive cases. The Laozi case could be a well-known example. In this case, a unanimous chamber de decision was overwritten by a conv convincing majority of the grand chamber. Other sensitive cases are decided by a narrow majority that also undermines the authority of this court. Like uh, earlier this year, the case of a Spanish priest who was uh, dismissed after a, a civil marriage, uh, a very narrow decision. Narrow decisions claim to have a binding constitutional force all over Europe. Instead of an inter partes decision re with regard to a limited number of cases of special importance, judgments tend to claim an erga omnes effect. The nature of European Court of Human Rights decisions or other constitutional court decisions is often misunderstood. A certain regulation not contradicting the convention does not mean that it would be the only regulation in conformity with it. The European Court of Human Rights calls itself the conscience of Europe. Words uh, seemingly sound well, but they appear in my eyes to disguise and to cover a misunderstood ambition. Uh, consciousness decisions are usually not made by eight votes to seven, or uh, they cannot be overturned by the Grand Chamber. To come to some practical issues, a set of sensitive issues arise day by day with regard to the borderlines um, of religious freedom, freedom of expression, equal treatment, etc. Step by step, the sphere of freedom is curtailed. The next step always seems to be logical, but the result is weird. Originally, the question was to decriminalize abortion in certain cases. Today, we can speak about an attempt to regard abortion as a right. As the well-known attempt to create new rights, we can refer to the Estrella report discussed in the European Parliament, arguing for the right to safe and legal abortion. The right not to perform or advise an abortion becomes under attack, clearly curtailing the freedom of conscience of uh, pro-life doctors and medical staff. First, the, play, the space of freedom seems to grow, but at the second glance, a growing social pressure gains space on vulnerable persons who got their right 
to choose. Those choosing life become suffering victims of social, ex social exclusion. The Lunacek report, which was even adopted, on the EU roadmap against homophobia and discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity, adopted February this year, strives to broaden equality exactly by curtailing the freedom, the space, the sphere of freedom. By its concept of tolerant education, parental rights are curtailed. The rights of the family are limited by the way human sexuality is treated in itself disrespectful to human dignity. Rights, of course, can compete. And it is the responsibility of the legislation and the judiciary to find equitable compromises. But a healthy equilibrium between rights can only be achieved on the basis of human dignity. Without a solid basis, we risk to fall from one extreme into another. The proposed directive, fortunately it was not, finally it was not adopted by the Commission. The proposed directive by, by the Council, by the Commission yet. The proposed directive with regard to equal treatment in access to all goods and services wanted to expand the horizontal equal treatment policy to all kinds of services. This can only happen, or could only happen, by limiting the freedom and the private life of citizen and by expanding state control over society. While earlier anti-discrimination directives established the principle of equal treatment in carefully defined areas, such as employment, the pending proposal aims to impose governmental control over the social and economic behavior of citizens in the widest possible sense. It would affect both the public and the private sector in the fields of social protection, education, access and supply of goods and services, including housing. The directive speaks to establish an ill-conceived ill concept of equal treatment as a horizontal principle governing the relationships between all and everyone, thus interfering with the right of self-determination of all citizens. What can be our answer to all these challenges? The legal system can be somewhat more conservative than the society is. But the maximum range of this space is probably one generation. In many European countries, we witness legal changes that are way more liberal than the social consensus. But the latter may follow the changes with the legislation. On the long run, I see no chance in focusing on legal work. The social consensus has to be rebuilt, and this needs convinced testimony, radical proposals, a brave dialogue, just being conservative doesn't help. Concerning the fundaments of our social coexistence, our proposal can be a new emphasis on natural law. Our most valuable contribution to the issue of human rights is to readdress their fundament. Departing uh, from a harmful loose canon, this again could make the rights to be a powerful defense for our culture and society a culture and society that often doesn't even feel anymore that it needed to be defended. Many of our compatriots don't feel under attack. Pope Benedict XVI, in his address uh, to the General Assembly to the United Nations in 2008, has put it as follows with regard to human dignity, which is the foundation and the goal of the responsibility to protect. This document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was the outcome of a convergence of different religions and cultural traditions, all of them motivated by the common desire to place the human person at the heart of the institutions, laws, and workings of society, and to consider the human person essential for the world of culture, religion, and science. Human rights are increasingly being presented as the common language and the ethical substratum of international relations. At the same time, the universality, indivisibility, and interdependence of human rights all serve as guarantees 
safeguarding human dignity. It is evident, though, that the rights recognized and expounded in the Declaration apply to everyone by virtue of the common origin of the person who remains at the high point of God's creative design and the word for its history. They are based on the natural law inscribed on human right, hearts and present in different cultures and civilizations. Removing human rights from this con context would mean restricting their range and yielding to a relativistic conception, according to which the meaning and interpretation of rights could vary from their universality, would be they would be denied in the name of different cultural, political, social, and even religious outlooks. This great variety of viewpoints must not be allowed to obscure the fact that not only rights are universal, but so too is the human person, the subject of these rights." Unquote. In his essential address to the German Bundestag, His Holiness has given us a truly deep reflection suggesting uh, natural law as the fundament of our social coexistence, a document I think is, that is, that is uh, very essential uh, for the discussion on, on fundamental rights. To come to a conclusion with some practical remarks, that I can say without any kind of authority. My private suggestions, maybe possible commitments of Christians uh, who are called in our days to reinforce the position of the human person, a person endowed with rights and dignity. First of all, yes, uh, we do have to fight the battles in courts and parliaments without believing that a good law or a victory in a given case would stand for salvation. Hot issues from same-sex marriage to the right to life or the borderlines of equal treatment are of relevance and we have to be aware of what is at stake. Our friends who fight these battles should not be left alone in their service. But salvation won't come from a core decision. Secondly, The truth, the ontology of things has to be upheld, knowing that most fellow citizens, including judges who, uh, who are often pretend to, to be the ultimate, uh, ultimate reference, the ontology of things uh, the, uh, has to be upheld. We all know that most of our fellow citizens are not interested in philosophy. When ideas become more and more confusing, clarity can be the nucleus and the base of the human heart. I think that's a fundamental prophetical service that we, have to, we are called to. Thirdly, it is certainly insufficient just to react to challenges. An original presence has to be creative. In this respect, there are no professionals. Each and every person All Christians are called to find the appropriate words and gestures to express their esteem to his and her or her fellow. Then uh, we have to go back to the most essential and fundamental issues. What has been evident for thousands of years has to be reinforced every day now. For example, what does it mean to be a man or a woman, not just male or female? Living in a real world instead of dreams of a virtual reality needs special efforts. Christ is real. The encounter with him is only possible in this reality. And lastly, the most important issues are determined in and by the family, not by legislation or judiciary. Laws can help safeguarding a culture of marriage, a culture of family, a culture of dignity, But law cannot maintain these values. Education should be the primary, primary concern of all adults, not just that of professionals. As the Italian singer and songwriter Biagio Antonacci, very sympathetic, has the same patron saint as I have, as Biagio Antonacci has put it, c'è ancora qualcuno, c'è ancora qualcuno che parla di dignità, come fosse il suo bene più caro, il più sudato traguardo, chi vive degno di sé, 
vive de re. I don't want to say that too loud, as we are too close to the royal palace. We are all called to live as kings and to invite our fellows to live as kings too. Thank you for your patience.